Welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar, The Importance of Identity to GDPR, with guest speakers and GDPR experts from Venable LLP. Our conversation is led today by Jeremy Grant, who is former Senior Executive Advisor for Identity Management at NIST and who previously led the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, and Kelly DeMarcus Bestide, um, partner of e-commerce, privacy, and cybersecurity at Venable. We have an A-list crew today for you guys. We're super excited. Um, you're also joined by Beyond Trust Senior Director of Solutions Architect, Brian Chappell, and SailPoint Director of Product Marketing, Jackie Brinkerhoff. This dynamic duo will run you through how you can reach GDPR compliance requirements with privileged access management and identity governance solutions from Beyond Trust and SailPoint. So please stick around for that portion after our headlines. My name is Sarah, your webinar host today. A kind reminder to please submit your questions via the GoToMeeting console anytime throughout the webinar, and we will cover your questions at the end during our Q&A time. So anytime you have a question, just pop it on in. I will be monitoring those throughout. Also, today's session is being recorded. You all will receive a follow-up email containing links to the recording and the slides shown here today within one to two business days from now. So at this point, let's hand it on over to Kelly from Venable, who will kick the presentation off. Kelly, welcome, and please jump right in. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, I'm going to present kind of some of the background of GDPR, some of the legal uh, underpinnings of our discussion today. Uh, so let's just jump right in. Um, we thought we would start with just some GDPR basics and an overview. Um, I think as, as most folks on the call probably know, the GDP, GDPR becomes the law of the land in Europe on May 25, 2018, when it becomes legally enforceable. It replaces existing law, the EU Data Protection Directive, which has been in place since 1995. And the shift from a directive to a regulation means that it, it will be a single standard across all of Europe and doesn't require um, member state specific implementing law uh, for most aspects of the regulation. Just to give everyone an overview of some of the key principles, um, many of which are taken from the directive, but certainly build on and expand what's in existing law. Um, the GDPR requires transparency or specific information to be told to individuals they refer to as data subjects, and we'll probably use both terms interchangeably. And that usually comes in the form of privacy policy, which has specific requirements uh, now, thanks to the GDPR. There are fundamental rights that are given to data subjects over their personal data. Um, there are new requirements for accountability for data controllers and data processors, and we'll unpack what those concepts mean. Uh, requirements in some instances to have a data protection officer or a DPO and to do privacy impact assessments or PIAs. There are new data security and data breach requirements, which we'll spend some time on during this presentation. Um, requirements that organizations elect a supervisory authority, which means that you choose the regulator that will um, apply to your processing activities and requirements around international data transfers or, or cross-border data transfer, which means whenever you move or access uh, the data of European individuals from outside of Europe. There are two reasons why the GDPR really has transfixed um, US companies and organizations. Uh, the first is its territorial scope. Um, the GDPR applies to you if you have what they call an establishment in Europe, simply offices or employees there but it is also now explicitly extraterritorial and applies to non-EU-based organizations in two circumstances. So where you don't have that EU establishment, the GDPR applies to you if you are processing the data of EU residents in connection with goods or services offered to that resident while they're in Europe, or if you're monitoring the behavior of individuals within the EU. And that monitoring of behavior really is intended to go towards um, online advertising, uh, tracking, social media, those kinds of that, uh, players. The second reason why the GDPR is getting so much attention in the United States are the penalties, which are punitive and severe. Uh, there are three penalty tiers provided for in the regulation, and as you'll see, the highest penalty tier would go to 4% of uh, a company's worldwide turnover, which means revenue, or 20 million euro, whichever is higher. There's um, 
a, a lower penalty tier, which goes to 2% of worldwide turnover or 10 million euro, again, whichever is higher. But that's only for sort of a, a limited set of um, infringements of the regulation. 4% uh, really goes to kind of the bulk of the regulation. So that's going to be your maximum penalty. And um, you can imagine that can be significant into the billions of dollars for certain companies in the U.S. Okay, so we wanted to unpack just a couple of core concepts here. The GDPR applies to the processing of personal data, so I think it's important to understand what personal data is. It's an extremely broad definition. It talks about any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. And then you have to look to the definition of identifiable person, which is uh, an individual who's identified not just by name or a piece of personally identifiable information, or PII, kind of the way we would think of it in the U.S., but anyone that could be identified by tying them either directly or indirectly to an, um, an identifier, which includes identif identification numbers, but also online identifiers like IP addresses or cookies. Um, this definition means really that uh, there isn't a conception um, that you can quote unquote anonymize data by tying it back to an identify identifier um, and then you know not um, having that identifier tied directly to a name. Instead, that type of data is also personal data and is regulated by the GDPR. And then we start to talk about data controllers or data processors. These are um, two concepts uh, that apply to companies. Uh, you are either one or the other. Um, regarding a particular activity, although in some cases the same company could be a, a controller and then a processor for different activities. Uh, a controller is a legal person who determines the purposes and means of processing the personal data, and then the data processor um, simply carries out the instructions of the data controller, and they process personal data on behalf of the controller. These concepts are important because most of the substantive responsibilities of the data of the GDPR go to the data controller, um, and the controller is responsible or liable for any processors it engages for their activities. Although data processors now for the first time are directly regulated in the EU for certain activities like data security. So we, we don't have time, obviously, to go through uh, all of the obligations of the GDPR, but we did want to provide some sense of what the GDPR requires. So we thought a good way to do that would be to spend some time discussing the data protection principles. Um, these are written into the GDPR itself in Article 5, um, and most of the substantive obligations of the GDPR are designed to operationalize these principles. So they provide a really good overview of um, some of the substance of the regulation. We're just going to highlight them quickly and then dig into some of them more specifically where they're relevant to today's discussion. Um, data processing has to be lawful, fair, and transparent, which means you have to tell individuals about your processing activities and have a lawful basis for those activities. Um, there's a purpose limitation principle, which means essentially that you have to um, determine the purposes for which you process data, and then in conjunction with transparency, you have to tell individuals the purposes for which you're processing data. Um, and if you try to then take that same data and process it in a way that's inconsistent with those stated purposes, you're not permitted to do it absent um, repermissioning that data from the data subjects. Uh, there is an explicit minimization principle, which we'll discuss in greater detail. And there's an accuracy principle. Um, this is a conception that we have in the United States, you know, related to very specific data types, namely, um, you know, credit reporting data, which has accuracy principles around it. The GDPR applies accuracy broadly to all personal data. Um, and part of that, of course, is giving individuals the right to erase or correct um, data. Three more principles uh, to highlight here. There's a storage limitation principle. It's tied to data minimization, and it goes to deleting data that's no longer needed. It also allows for de-identifying data um, as a safeguard, although the standard for de-identification is, is pretty high. There's an integrity principle, and that's really the genesis for data security, which we'll spend some time discussing here. And then seven, the accountability principle. Um, this goes to extensive new record-keeping provisions that are found throughout the regulation. 
and because we um, discuss, you know, we're going to discuss minimization and integrity and confidentiality in some detail, we just wanted to give you the text from the article on those two principles. Okay, to unpack some of the articles which are uh, important for today's discussion, Article 25 enshrines the principle of data protection by design into law, requires organizations to take into account the state of the art, the cost of implementation, and the nature of their processing activities and weigh them against risks to the individuals from those activities, and then um, implement measures that are designed to make privacy and security part of their products and services by design and default. Um, as you see here, there are um, certain, they, they highlight certain approaches like data minimization, um, but these are supposed to be built into your products and services um, to ensure that um, your products only process the personal data which is necessary for your stated purposes. Okay, Article 32 defines the requirements for data security, um, which means for the first time there'll be a comprehensive security uh, baseline across all of the EU. It's a flexible, technologically neutral standard, um, and it discusses the implementation of appropriate security measures um, to ensure that the security is appropriate, again, relative to the risks to the individual. Um, the regulation also provides some specific elements that should be taken into account as you design security, including measures for system resilience, for restoration, and for regular testing of those safeguards. Um, Article 33 and 34 now lay out requirements for data breach notification, which is a concept that they stole from U.S. law. It's a two-tier notification. Uh, organizations must report breaches to their supervisory authority within 72 hours, although uh, they're allowed to kind of weigh the risk to the data um, in determining whether it's a reportable incident. But, of course, the 72-hour time frame is, is a pretty aggressive one and likely will lead organizations probably to, to over-report um, because of, it's, it's you know, unclear whether they'll be able to make appropriate determinations within that time frame. Um, as you'll see, the notification has certain required elements, including the number of people impacted, the nature of the records breached, um, and any measures that the organization has taken to address the breach. And then it has also requirements for notifications to individuals. Um, that's a risk trigger, um, but unlike the U.S. where that risk is often tied to things like identity theft or fraud, um, the risk to individuals is supposed to be weighed as whether, you know, the, the breach will result in a high risk to the rights and freedoms of someone, and if so, it has to be reported without undue delay. And the guidance that has come out around that has some really interesting examples of what would constitute a, a risk to the rights and freedom of an individual, but it's obviously um, a broader, more subjective standard than in the U.S. Uh, Article 16 and 20 lay out specific individual rights, um, and we sort of think of this as the heart of the GDPR because it's a, a list of seven or so rights that individuals have over their data. Uh, we've highlighted here three of them, the right to rectification or correction, which goes back to that accuracy principle, um, a right to erasure, which is, you know, sometimes been called the right to be forgotten, which allows an individual to request um, in certain circumstances that an entity delete personal data, and then a new right to data portability, which permits an individual to request a copy of his or her personal data um, in an easily portable, machine-readable format. Um, and in some cases, they can request that the data controller transmit that personal data directly to another data controller. Um, there are also other rights that aren't on this slide, which include um, a right to transparency, the right to restrict process, and a right to access personal data. Um, all of these rights are not unbounded, but instead are linked to the lawful basis under which a controller processes data. So it requires uh, a degree of data mapping and real nuanced understanding of the reasons why um, you, know, you collect and use data, um, which will help you determine in which circumstances you have to honor um, requests from individuals. 
Just a few more articles we wanted to highlight. I think this is actually the last one. Article 30, uh, this goes to the new accountability requirements, and it requires firms to maintain records of all the personal data they process, um, including who they're sharing the data with, how long it's how it's secured and how long they maintain it until it's deleted. Um, requ uh, records are required and are subject to inspection from your supervisory authority. Um, and if you're a processor, uh, you also have to provide them to your data controller upon request for their inspection. Um, there are some exemptions to these requirements for organizations that have fewer than 250 employees, just to note. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Jeremy. Thanks, Kelly. That was a great overview of GDPR and some of the things organizations need to be thinking about. So I want to take it up just a bit of a level um, in that, you know, I think the last few slides we looked at, I think it's 11 different articles in GDPR that all impact different things around uh, data security, data breaches, uh, or uh, managing data and, and the rights that consumers have. And obviously it can be pretty exhausting to, uh, to go through everything and figure out what you need to do to check the box to comply. Uh, although we're certainly doing that for, for plenty of clients these days uh, who are looking to go through it. But taking it up a level for purposes of this webinar, um, I, I think there's a couple key things when it comes to GDPR and identity that are important for organizations to keep in mind. The first is that data breaches have real consequences. And I think that's a statement that in and of itself has been the case for years now. But when we're looking at mandatory 72-hour breach notification, uh, some of the big fines that we were talking about up to uh, uh, 4% of your, of your company's annual revenue, it puts a real big incentive in place to start to get data security right. And um, I think in general that's probably a positive thing for the world, especially because organizations often have, have looked at, you know, investments they might consider making in data security and, you know, not giving them the highest priority. Um, I think it's pretty clear today uh, that with this kind of enforcement, organizations have a real incentive to put proper security controls in place, both to keep adversaries out as well as potentially adversaries that are coming from the inside. Inside threat continues to be a big issue. And then I think the second big takeaway here from an identity perspective is that organizations need to know what data they have, where they have it, and quite importantly, who's doing what with it. Uh, there was a line from an analyst report I saw recently that pointed out that job one of a consumer-facing identity system under GDPR is to have a way to get the consumer back to their own data. That means if a consumer has to correct it, view it, delete it, transfer their data to another, uh, another entity, organizations need to have a way to respond. And that's not actually the easiest thing for a lot of companies to do. So yeah, I want to focus just on the first point for a bit. I mentioned you know, we, have, we have two to start, data breaches of consequences, and then focusing on, on, on data. Let me focus on the data breach side for a bit. The big question that always seems to come after these breaches is the classic question of, why do bad things keep happening to good people? And you know, there, there's certainly a broader discussion to have there. But from a perspective of data breaches and cybersecurity, to me, the more interesting and important question is how. How do these bad things keep happening year after year? And when you start to take a look at you know, the, the evidence and, and some of the analysis of how our big breaches happen, there's a few trends that continue to uh, pop up year after year. So one of my favorite um, reports that comes out every year is the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. For those who aren't familiar with it, Verizon publishes it, but they work with a, a bunch of different vendors, including competitors in the space. And interestingly, they also work with law enforcement agencies from around the world. And they do a great job every year of slicing and dicing all the bad things that happened in cyberspace and actually looking at well, how did they actually happen. So last year's report, there was one number that really stood out, which was that 81% of breaches leverage either stolen or weak passwords which is really a pretty stunning number when you look at how things happen. It means it's an anomaly when a major breach happens and an attack on the identity system of an organization wasn't the, uh, the primary attack vector. And by the way, I should note this is not exactly a new trend. I think for the last five or six years that Verizon has been, been, been doing this report, it's been somewhere between uh, two-thirds and you know, here on the high of 81% of breaches that are you know, uh, focusing with an attack on, uh, on identity and passwords to start. And you know, specifically with the, the real trend that we've seen the last few years that's really escalated is a focus on phishing as a vector of attack. Uh, you know, you know, so if you look at reports in the anti-phishing working group, there's been more than a 65% increase in attacks over what we saw in 2015. And you know, certainly with the, the, the data that we've seen and, and talking to a lot of firms in the space, on average, 15% of users are going to fall for any phishing attack, which actually means it's a pretty 
um, valuable attack to launch and that if you launch 100 emails, 15 are actually going to click on them. And you know, these are largely focused on getting people to give up their usernames and passwords. Now, because of the attacks on the passwords, we've seen a focus on uh, two-factor authentication in organizations, which is really a good way to, to mitigate the impact of phishing, except that what we're seeing here is the attackers are catching up with it. SMS codes, guess what? They can you know, get you to uh, enter that code into the same site that you entered your password, and that's phishable as well. Same with if it's a one-time password code generated from an app or a token. And so you know, as uh, the controls keep getting better, the attackers are catching up as well. And in fact, you know, one number that, that just made my jaw drop about nine months ago uh, came from uh, a speech Microsoft gave at the Cloud Identity Summit, which uh, is an event I've, I've you know, been a part of the last few years. It's been rebranded Identiverse uh, this year, but it, it, it's notable in that a lot of uh, the major players in, in the IAM space, uh, including you know, uh, you know, the folks we're doing this call with today, all come and talk about some of the trends they're seeing you know, over the last year, and it's a good chance to you know, get a check in terms of where we are and, and where we need to focus. Last year, they revealed that they're now seeing 100 million attempted account compromises each day, which was up five times from the previous year's amount, which was also jaw-dropping. That was 20 million. And you know, there's a reason that this is happening. It's that this is the way that you get into enterprises to start to uh, take over uh, uh, systems and, and, and do bad things. And you know, one more uh, uh, statistic I'll give you. Just this morning, Symantec put out its internet security threat report they said that 71% of all the breaches they looked at last year started with phishing attacks. So this is a, a real issue. Attacks on identity are a real issue when you're worried about data security. And then when you talk about, you know, how do bad things keep happening, what happens in enterprises once somebody's gotten that initial username and password and they've taken over an account? Well, there was another alert that came out a couple years ago from the folks at SecureWorks, who, if you don't know, is one of the largest managed security providers uh, in, in the world, you know, providing security services for different firms. And they put something out in September of 2015 that also made my jaw drop because it was at a time when, you know, it, it seemed like it was hard to, to look at cybersecurity without a discussion about malware. And uh, they basically came out and said, nine months into the year, we're seeing a really interesting trend, which is that nobody's even bothering with malware right now. Not that we're advising you to not focus on, on malware and preventing malware, but in pretty much every breach we've, we've, we've responded to this year, Cyber criminals were utilizing the target's own system credentials and legitimate software administration tools to execute an attack that they called living off the land, which basically meant step one, compromise a credential through phishing or some other approach. Two, once they're in there, find a way to escalate the privilege of that account that they held. And then three, move laterally across the, uh, the company's networks, infecting other parts of it and collecting valuable data. And the basic message was, this is a really big deal, and this is you know something that we're we're, we're seeing you know all over the place. And you know, to me, it was another uh, flag in terms of the importance of uh, good identity security and a fundamental holistic approach to how you implement it, to making sure that you can actually protect against data breaches and, and manage your risk. And you know, I, I think it's it's helpful to just sort of look at you know we talk about breaches, and sometimes people ask you know why are these things happening? Look, folks, crime and theft have been happening for you know thousands of years. But things have evolved significantly. You know, back in the 1950s, when they asked the famous bank robber Willie Sutton, "Why do you rob banks?" He had a great answer, which is, "That's where the money is." Well, in 2018, why are adversaries going after identity? Well, because that's where the data, and often with it, the bigger money is. So, uh, crime has always been there, but the attack vector has changed, and identity is a big uh, driver these days in terms of what adversaries are actually using to to execute this theft. So. A few practical uh, pieces of advice from the, the you know, idea of data security and GDPR, particularly when it comes to mitigating the identity, uh, the, 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 the threat of attacks on identity systems. One, make sure you're locking down your logins. Passwords alone aren't adequate. Even a complex password can easily be phished. And so you know, critical accounts and, and arguably all of your accounts need to be implementing multi-factor authentication. And as I mentioned a few slides back, uh, what is considered good MFA these days is also evolving. Uh, you know, SMS and OTP are fishable. Uh, we're seeing cautions from some of the biggest firms in the space, you know, giving concrete examples of uh, where these codes have been fished. And so ideally you want to be focusing on what uh, the folks at Javelin Research uh, recently dubbed high assurance strong authentication, where at least one of the factors is leveraging public key cryptography that gets you to an unfishable authentication approach. Now that doesn't mean you need full-blown PKI, and I know that can be uh, uh, 
call it a four-letter word, even though it's only got three letters, but in the security space that can sometimes, you know, cause a lot of headaches. It can also be more lightweight versions of authentication that leverage public key crypto, uh, like the FIDO standards that are increasingly getting built into a lot of solutions. Uh, and that can be a way to, you know, not only deliver very strong, unfishable multi-factor authentication, but do it in a way that can actually streamline the login process a bit as well. It's not like anybody likes typing in these second factor codes anyways. Second, you know, getting back to that point from SecureWorks and other, you know, trends we've seen, it's important to lock down your privileged accounts. You know, attacks on, on privileged accounts, these are where the most damaging high profile attacks are continually happening. And it's very important to have a privileged access management uh, uh, solution in space. Uh, in, in, uh, in place. Uh, when you look at, you know, these attacks like, you know, what was dubbed living on the land by SecureWorks, it's really clear this is where bad things happen. And, you know, from my perspective, as we advise different clients in the identity space, it's hard to say an organization's taking cyber risk seriously if you know that this is such a commonly exploited attack vector and you're not taking care of uh, putting uh, some controls in place uh, to uh, address that risk. And then third, while both multi-factor authentication and privilege access management are important uh, in and of themselves, and, and I wouldn't tell anybody not to do them, ideally you want to be uh, taking a more holistic approach to identity and access management that looks at both of these as a broader component of your uh, a broader components of your approach to identity governance. And you know, identity governance, as our friends from SailPoint will talk about a little more in this call, really focuses on taking a, a high-level approach and then getting very granular as well in terms of how you manage uh, who has access to what resources and under what circumstances or conditions. <clears throat> how do you grant or revoke access rights on a need-to-know basis and update these rights regularly to adjust for changes to a person's role or, or their status in your enterprise? You know, a problem I've, I've consistently seen in breaches is that somebody was given access to a system and then their role changed, uh, or maybe they left the company and you still have these, these phantom accounts that are out there that aren't closed down. It's really important to go through regularly and actually make sure that every account only has access to those, uh, those resources that they actually have a reason to have access to and that those rights are withdrawn uh, at the appropriate time. And finally, it's important to have an audit function uh, to audit past events, review that your IAM system is actually being used properly. And I think that's good not just from a compliance perspective, you know, particularly if you're regulated uh, and somebody's coming in to, to look at how you're managing your access uh, rights, but also if there is an event and something goes wrong, you know, as a law firm uh, with a, a large data security and privacy practice, a lot of times when we're brought in after a breach, it's, you know, the first question is, how do we get a handle on what actually happened here? Because if we have to reveal something, we want to be able to tell a good story. Well, you know, audit function is really important there to be able to go back and do the work to figure out uh, where things were working and, and where things weren't and, you know, hopefully identify a point that, that was exploited and, or where controls broke down. So you know, focus on identity governance and treating this holistically is very important. Um, so the second point I raised earlier is, you know, under GDPR, you really need to know what data you have, where you have it, and who's doing what with it. And as I mentioned before, job one of an identity system, how do you get the consumer back to their own data? Because if I'm asking uh, somebody to correct or delete or transfer their data, you need to have a way to respond. So it turns out this is not really an easy thing to do for a lot of companies. Um, so you know, I've got the image here of, um, I won't call it a junkyard, that'd be too cruel, but somebody's collection of stuff. And, you know, I, I don't think it, it's overkill to say that for a lot of companies, this sort of reflects their approach to collecting and storing data. So understanding, you know, some of these requirements in place, it's really important to, you know, know up front, what data do you have? Where is it stored? How is it being protected? How can it be accessed and by whom and under what specific conditions? It's really hard for any entity to know what to protect or how to protect it until you can actually answer some of these key questions. And, you know, once you have answers there, once it's sorted, then you have to start to, you know, come up with some questions like, how am I classifying different types of data? And keep in mind under GDPR, uh, where there's rules for data minimization and, you know, lots uh, of requirements for only collecting what's needed at a particular time and then looking to delete it afterwards, classification of data becomes a really big deal. And, you know, once it's classified, how do you manage and protect each classification? Um, what types of data should only be seen by, by special users like privileged users? And by the way, privilege, you know, might be expanded to mean, um, you know, certain roles in your company as well as, you know, more traditional privileged users who have access to, you know, certain high-risk IT resources. Um, with that, are there additional controls that are applied for some of these types of data? Can you demonstrate that you're taking steps to minimize the usage of this data? And you have the ability 
uh, to remove it or change it or give it back to someone if they asked. So a key takeaway here with GDPR compliance is beyond data security, organizations need an approach to governing and managing access to data. Now, if you don't have a great way to do this and you're trying to do this on a case-by-case -case basis, odds are pretty good it's going to make your head explode. But the good news is this doesn't actually have to be a chore. So instead, I've been a big advocate of you know, leveraging a compliance driver like GDPR, not as a headache uh, or a cause for head explosion, but rather as an opportunity. You know, leverage this as a strategic point in, in your enterprise's uh, uh, journey to take a step back and actually look at the way that identity can be called what I call the great enabler. Because what we've seen over the years is that when companies treat identity as a strategic priority rather than just something that's a cost center, uh, it really can be an enabler of a whole bunch of good things for your company and your customers. So uh, identity can provide a foundation for better you know, customer experiences uh, as well as how your employees actually go about doing their, uh, their job each day. You can streamline processes in your enterprise for both privileged and non-privileged users. It allows you to automate compliance and reduce compliance costs with it. And it's a way to eliminate headaches that are involved with what's generally going to be constant change across your enterprise, as well as changes in the kinds of data that you might collect and store from year to year, depending on how your business evolves. So taking a step back and, you know, rather than, you know, focusing just on something for compliance, look at this strategically. Look at identity as the great enabler. And that's a great way to put your position, your, your firm in a, a position uh, to not only comply with GDPR, uh, but also be in a good position to be more competitive in the marketplace in the years ahead. So uh, we've got our, our contact information here, and welcome the chance uh, we'll look later on the webinar to address any questions as well as uh, in follow-up. And at this point, I think, Sarah, we're going to hand things uh, back off to you. All right. And uh, thank you, Jeremy. It's Jackie here from CellPoint. And I'd like to take a moment now to help you understand how CellPoint's able to address a lot of what's been covered here with regards to GDPR. First of all, as Jeremy was just talking about, uh, we do see identity as a great enabler for businesses. And this is because it's when it's placed in the center of an IT and security infrastructure, we find that it provides organizations uh, what we refer to as an identity-aware infrastructure. And what this means is that you can have the ability to know and manage three main things, as uh, Jerry, Jeremy uh, pointed out earlier. But first of all, it's who currently has access, who should have access, and finally, how is that access being used? And this is important when it comes to GDPR because it states in Article 5, organizations must have accountability, or in other words, the ability to prove their compliance with the directive around the handling and the storage and the usage of personal data. And so if I go back to that key word, they must prove their compliance. And that's something that SailPoint Identity Governance uh, can definitely help with. So with an identity governance solution in place, you can comply with all four articles of GDPR that pertain specifically to identity governance. And so first of all is personal data protection. And this includes setting up automatic discovery and classification of personal data, along with crowdsourcing the appropriate data owners and stewards who will perform your regular access reviews. The second is to secure the personal data you just found. And you can get full visibility over what sensitive data that you have, and as well as who can and is accessing that data. Then you can extend your controls over that data with automatic access modifications or revocation, depending on the change that's been detected. And then beyond the initial security setup, you must also have monitoring and detection in place, such as fine-grained audit trails that help with forensics after a breach does occur and help to demonstrate your compliance as per Article 5. And as part of the rest of the automation, our identity governance solution provides alerts to the data owners of any violations or access violations specified in your policies. And you can also set up role-based access control to ensure that any access that is granted is the minimum needed for that particular user's role. In addition, your identity governance solution should be logging and reporting on everything, not only to create that rich identity context that we love to leverage across the IT and security infrastructure, but 
that identity context helps enable that identity where infrastructure and gives you that paper trail uh, to prove your compliance. And finally, as Jeremy also noted, it, it's important to remember that sensitive information is not necessarily just stored in one particular location. It's all across your organization, across systems and applications that reside uh, and are accessed from a non-privileged standpoint as well as a privileged access standpoint. And so being able to have a complete 360 degree view of that access, privileged and non-privileged, and being able to apply consistent controls really becomes important to help realize the benefits of identity governance and what it can provide. And for that reason, CellPoint partnered and integrated with Beyond Trust to make this possible in a very simple and secure way for enterprise organizations. And so with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Brian, and uh, he'll give you a little bit more insight with regards to Beyond Trust. Thank you, Jackie. And uh, thanks, everyone, for hanging on through to this, uh, this part of the presentation. Um, now, as has been said before, obviously, um, we get very focused on protecting the, the privileged access and the privileged accounts within our environment. And that is vitally important in ensuring that we maintain a secure environment in which to hold the data of the, of the users that we're managing and whether those be internal or external users. And it's interesting just for a second to think again about uh, the, the attack chain that uh, Jeremy alluded to earlier, the fact that uh, people are gaining access to environments, not always through privileged accounts to begin with, but often through those, least, those uh, unprivileged accounts, the kind of things that IAM is absolutely brilliantly positioned to, to initially control and uh, establish uh, auditing around for us so that we know who's got access, where they've got access, and what they're using that access for. That is an initial approach into the environment, whether that comes in through a vulnerability to a system, through a phishing attack, through whatever mechanism, even we still see something like 12% of attacks involve purchased credentials. So those are things we really find it hard to do defend against. But what we can do is we can then layer on additional defenses. So the IAM having a view across who should have access, what accounts should be there, where they should be, all those kinds of things are vitally important for, for looking at a, a secure environment. The attacker then will often hijack privilege within the environment. So again, using vulnerabilities, sometimes trying to harvest accounts out of memory, all sorts of things there to gain some privilege because it's rarely the system that they come into which is the system that's actually going to have the, uh, the crown jewels, that piece of vitally important information that they want to take, your intellectual property in effect. And that's where they look at the lateral movement within the environment and that's where the uh, privilege escalation is most commonly used and most commonly useful. Things like local uh, administrator accounts, root accounts, uh, device accounts, either using the default passwords, we still see that in environments, or using common passwords across the environment because it is so difficult to track and control all of those kinds of uh, uh, credential accesses. So the lateral movement is vital to try and control because that's what leads them to be able to then take your data and put it on a dark web website and make lots of money out of it before your users are even aware of what's going on. So next slide, please. So this is where IAM and PAM can actually really begin to develop some, some benefit to you as a, as a unified solution. So IAM is dealing with primarily who has the access to what. On the PAM side, we're going to gain control over those shared privileged accounts, those shared credentials that are associated with those. We're going to rotate them. We're going to control who has access to them, when, where. We'll be able to, be able to see when people are gaining access outside of that process chain. We're also able to implement things like least privilege so that even the users who do have legitimate access inside your environment are only ever gaining that access at the level that they need, the least privilege necessary for them to be fully productive within what they're doing. But we then need to know if it's being used 
appropriately. So when we bring solutions like Beyond Trust and SailPoint together, we have a very tight integration that allows you to do attestation from the very beginning of privilege being assigned through the IAM solution through to the PAM solution where the privilege is actually being delivered so that you can have that total visibility about what's going on within your environment. Vitally important, as Jackie said, for you to be able to prove that you have control over that data, prove when it was being accessed, and in the middle being able to make that decision point around that of is that access appropriate so that you can recertify people's access through your IAM solution and have that flow straight through into your PAM solution without you having to visit multiple environments to be able to do that. And having reporting on both sides that's able to do that kind of end-to-end -end assessment of what your privileged access environment looks like is just a godsend to anyone who's currently trying to manage that environment with, uh, within their infrastructure currently. Uh, so next slide. And as you can see, bringing that together, so I am delivering the discovery, the provision, the access certification, certification the access requests. When you uh, combine that with the deep controls that come with privileged access management through a solution like Beyond Trust with credential lockdown, access control. We know who has access to what, when they're using that access and what they're using it for. Session control, being able to actually monitor what's going on, record what's going on, have active reviews, have uh, audit points on the back end of that to show that they've been reviewed, recordings have been reviewed, etc. And then continuous monitoring, so you can implement things like the Four Eyes principle, the events coming up from the environment can go on into your SIEM system to give you even richer pictures of what's going on in your environment, while at the same time, when we bring these things together, we're actually reducing the amount of noise that's there in your environment. Fewer events coming up to your SIEM, more valuable events, because they're actually pointing you to abnormal behavior. We're no longer worrying about people using privilege and making sure they're only using it in the right way because we're only ever allowing them access to privilege at the right time in the right way through the tooling that's sitting in your environment in this kind of solution. So now you know your SIEM is getting the right information. It's much easier for you to find the signal in the noise that is actually going to lead you to identify quickly that there may have been a breach happen and potentially stop that data actually leaving your environment uh, before the hacker knows that you're onto them. So, you know, we still see, uh, as Jeremy mentioned, the DBIR, there's still, uh, I think it's an average of six months from intrusion to detection, which is an incredible length of time. We still see old vulnerabilities being used in establishing those uh, those uh, intrusions initially into the environment. I think in the 2016 DBIR, it showed vulnerabilities from 1998. There's still a lot of the basics that we need to get better at doing. And if we're looking to certify our company as being GDPR compliant, we need to make sure that we're getting our arms around those basics first before we start building the more elaborate people and processes on top of that so that we know we're building on a good and solid foundation. And I think when you have a properly integrated uh, IAM and PAM solution, so you have that end-to-end -end visibility, that's going to pay you dividends both in building your GDPR implementation and then also certifying and recertifying your GDPR implementation. That's it from me today. Just hand it back to Jackie to, uh, to finish off with some key points from SailPoint. Thanks, Brian. So I'd like to extend an invitation uh, to all of you to join us at a Navigate Identity Governance Conference near you. As you can see, we've got three different uh, geolocations throughout the year. And Navigate provides a rich experience for those that attend. So there's a lot of great information with technical pre-conference training. There's networking with other identity professionals from various industries. And it's a great opportunity to come learn about what's happening in identity, what innovations are, are coming up, and what the future of identity looks like. Our next conference is coming up in May in Austin, Texas, and as I mentioned, you're invited to attend, and if you're interested in knowing more, simply just visit the URL there. It's navigate.sellpoint.com. And with that, I'll pass it back over to Sarah.
Awesome. Thanks, Jackie. Um, next slide. Great. Perfect. Keep it right there. Let's go ahead and jump into a quick poll. Um, you guys should see that pop up on your screen right about now. Um, and if you are currently assessing your level of compliance with GDPR or want to learn more about how identity governance can help you meet GDPR requirements, please select to be contacted and receive a personalized demo with either a sale point or beyond trust representative or both. Um, we'd love to talk to you guys about everything GDPR. So I'm going to leave this up. Let's dive into a couple of questions for the last remaining minutes. We had a bunch come in for Jeremy and his team, so I'm going to launch these. Let's see. Um, this came in when Kelly was speaking, so it might be directed at Kelly or maybe Jeremy can also jump in, but are there examples for the right to consent and right to remove data form examples that can be obtained? Um, this is Kelly. I think if I understand the question, they're looking for kind of template language around um, around consent and then withdrawal of consent. Um, it may be the right to be forgotten as well. Um, there are a lot of different examples, but the consent standard has received a lot of attention because consent now must be specific, informed, and uh, affirmative from the user. And if you want to tick all of those boxes, the specific and informed pieces mean that at the point where consent is obtained, you're telling the user specifically what they are consenting to. So it's pretty hard to develop a template um, that, would, that would apply broadly to a lot of different companies or organizations, again, because that consent is supposed to be specific. Um, there are some examples in consent guidance that has come out of the EU that talks about the mechanism for consent and what constitutes acceptable affirmative consent. Everybody thinks about the unchecked box, but they, uh, the guidance does make clear that other affirmative actions are acceptable as well, including um, you know, a, a clearly obtained oral consent or other affirmative actions like waving your hand in front of um, the camera on your phone in a mobile context um, or you know, shaking the phone and, and taking advantage of the phone's accelerometer. So, um, there are a lot of examples that are out there, and it's meant to be a flexible standard, but it is specific to a company or organization. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. Thanks to everybody who submitted. Um, okay, Article 16 to 20, data portability allowed a request. Does that go together with an obligation to provide such data upon request? So I think, as we mentioned, all of those individual rights are not um, totally unbounded, and they go to the reasons for which uh, a company processes the data, which is why understanding your company's basis of processing is really important. So if you're processing data based on consent, then um, yes, the individual has a right of data portability around that data. If you're processing data for other reasons, though, for example, because you have a, a legal obligation to hold it, um, you don't have to extend those same portability rights. So portability is really intended for, for things like data that companies are holding for marketing purposes or you know, social media companies, that data, to allow you to move it to another platform. And I think you know, it'll be interesting to see if, if, um, who, who's able to capitalize on this. So you know, incentivizing users to move their data to their platform would be a, a really good way to obtain data. Um, but we'll, we'll see if, if uh, there are any sort of smart companies in Europe who will use this to their advantage after May 25th. Jeremy, um, any comment on ABAC as a way to apply compliance-related policies and verify alignment with access policy and to limit a quote-unquote attack surface when a credential is compromised? Yeah, so ABAC is attribute-based access control, which is you know, essentially a way to get to a more granular level of um, you know, looking at different things about users, you know, on your uh, on your network to make decisions uh, in terms of what they should and shouldn't access. So it's um, you know a little more complicated usually to implement in practice than traditional role-based access control. Um, but you know, where I've seen it done well, it can be very helpful in part because it can you know look at things like um, you know how certain elements of your role in a company might have changed over time. So I've, you know, generally been a, a fan of ABAC. I, I think, um, you know, it, you know, SailPoint certainly has, you know, some elements that, you know, that they've leveraged uh, uh, in their platform to uh, to put that into effect as well. So I, I think it can be 
again, if you're looking to get granular and you want to be able to have a really good answer, God forbid something you know does go wrong, or you know hopefully you know point out how you're preventing bad things from happening, uh, it can be a very valuable tool. Jackie, how does identity access management cover GDPR for data not within scope of IAM, like moving in and out of scope? So is that referring to data residing in files, if I'm understanding the question correctly? Um, maybe the person who submitted that question can clarify. Does anybody else on the line have a comment about that? How does identity access management cover GDPR for data not within scope of IAM? So you know, I'll address it, it from the standpoint of a file standpoint, if you wish. Um, so data, sensitive data is actually residing not only in systems and applications and uh, secured, those no secured uh, systems. However, a lot of data is getting leaked because you have regular business productivity people creating reports and extracting information from financial system, Salesforce, for instance, to create reports. And a lot of the sensitive information is now getting put into PowerPoints and Word documents and then shared and stored across a number of different file stores. So for instance, like Google Drive or Dropbox and, and then on-premises file share. So being able to also govern access to that where that sensitive information resides is just as important when it comes to GDPR. So again, as we mentioned, being able to identify and locate what that is, classifying it, and then also putting the appropriate access controls around it, as well as data stewards to help to help bridge and extend your identity governance program to also include all of that additional data that could be uh, a huge attack vector. In fact, um, Gartner came out with a quote not, not too long ago that basically stated that if you are incorporating your uh, governing access to files in addition to your identity governance program, you're going to significantly reduce your risk of breach. And I believe it was like up, upwards about 65%. And I was just going to add, I, I, to I add anything. Yeah, you know, from my perspective, you know, the, the, the customer data, the personal data that might be in, you know, say a customer facing IAM system um, is really only part of the equation. Um, and in some cases, it might be the, the least risky and that at least you know that it's there. It's more of what Jackie was saying data that you have that's made it into other places, you know, going back to my slides before of the junkyard and then the pile of sorted things, how do you actually get a full inventory of the personal data that you have and look for it in places that it, um, you weren't even quite sure it was there and then figure out what to do with it. And, you know, so I think a lot of what we're talking about today is much more about the way that a holistic approach to identity and access management can be used to, to manage and control that access once you know you have it, but you've got to be able to build that inventory first. Uh, I think this is going to be for Jeremy of the team at Venable. Does GDPR cover streaming recorded customer service calls that are held by a third party located in the EU but listened to or streaming by a U.S. company? So um, the answer is yes, probably. Uh, it goes back to that territorial scope slide. The, GDP, the GDPR covers any entity who is um, has an establishment in the EU or is offering their, their goods or services or monitoring the behavior of individuals who are in the EU. Um, although this is a pretty specific example, um, you know, at a high level, if you have a, a vendor who is in the EU, they're themselves directly covered. And then um, a US-based controller who engages the services of that vendor um, may be covered if they're offering goods or services, but they're certainly liable for their, if they're covered, they're liable for that um, EU-based vendor's uh, GDPR compliance. Uh, I think this is, again, for the team at Venable. Um, I believe large corporations are already well equipped with IAM and security tools, which offer as controls to GDPR. But how are SMBs responding to the GDPR requirements? Um, it, it's certainly a challenge for that community. The only place where there is an exception for, you know, de minimis data collection essentially comes in those accountability provisions, which are, are limited to um, organizations who have uh, 250 or more employees. Um, other than that, uh, you know, small and medium-based organizations are subject to all of the requirements of the GDPR, just as large companies are. And um, as we work with clients, 
meet that definition, it really does present um, a challenge and it strains resources. But there is no exception uh, for, for, for smaller companies, unfortunately. Uh, Kelly or Jeremy, when is a DPO, Data Protection Officer, required? Uh, a DPO is required if it's required in, in three instances. Um, if your organization has as its core activity the processing of um, criminal, criminal records information, that one likely doesn't apply to most entities. So a DPO is triggered in, in two other instances. If the core activity of your business is um, processing of special categories of data, and there are eight or so special categories. They include religious or political affiliation, trade union membership, um, data about health, um, about race and ethnicity. If that's a, a core um, processing activity of your organization, or if you are engaged in monitoring, uh, on a large scale, the behavior of EU data subjects, then you're required to appoint a DPO. Um, the guidance around DPO requirements also states that if you're, if you're in doubt, uh, a DPO should probably be your default position. Uh, Jeremy, I believe you were in Brussels last week meeting with the European Data Protection Supervisor. What takeaways, if any, did you draw from those conversations? Uh, yeah, it was a good set of meetings I had between Brussels and, and other places in Europe last week. And, and I think there's a, a few things that that you know stood out. One, um, you know, while we're getting a lot of questions here in the U.S., you know, folks are, are just as concerned in Europe. Um, lots of, uh, uh, of of issues and, and frankly uncertainty there. And I think that that was sort of the second takeaway is um, as as many articles as there are in GDPR, there's still more guidance that's you know expected to be forthcoming uh, from from the European Union in terms of how different things should be done. And so, you know, I would say one challenge in general is that uncertainty reigns supreme, and with it, um, a lot of you know organizations are are incented to um, not really you know take any of this line down, and you know they need to make sure they take it seriously. In part because even though a provision might be left to interpretation, if one of the 28 different data protection authorities that might be enforcing GDPR in Europe decides to make an issue of it. Uh, at that point, you know, there's already challenges. And, and I think that that's a key point that, that sometimes get lost is an enforcement action could be brought by, you know, if the Slovenian Data Protection Commissioner decides that they want to have a bone to pick with you, uh, even if you've satisfied others, uh, you know, you can still have, uh, you know, some concerns. And I think the final thing I, you know, that stood out is even within other European regulations, there's, you know, some places where the new rules in GDPR may clash with, um, other initiatives in Europe right now. You know, a lot of the, the, the reason I was in Europe is work I've been doing around uh, financial services for clients around what people generally refer to as the open banking space, where there's a new uh, payment services directive two, PSD2, that's requiring banks, if I as a consumer ask them to let a third party uh, see my financial information or even take money out of my account to be a payment provider, uh, I, the, the banks have to have a way to do that. Well, identity is a huge part of that, and one of the questions that you know came up in conversations I've had is, you've got one thing that says we have to open up data and let it go, and another thing that says we have to be more careful in terms of who we allow to see it. How do we reconcile those two? Lots of questions that are out there. Um, the only you know encouraging thing I can say for folks in this call is if you're focusing on identity, uh, you're at least ahead of the game in that good identity solutions you know that you implement in a strategic fashion can really help to. Uh, uh, to address both of these issues. All right, and that's a great way to wrap up. Um, thank you, everybody, for all of the questions. Um, we love an engaging, uh, engaged audience, so thank you so much for attending and for submitting those questions. Um, a reminder that you will receive an email with a link to the recording and the slides shown here today within one to do business days from now, and it will come from our email alias communications at beyondtrust.com, so be on the lookout for that follow-up. Please visit that Next Steps link that's here on your screen um, to learn more about GDPR and how SailPoint and Beyond Trust can help you guys with your GDPR compliance. Um, a big thanks again to all of our experts. Thank you guys. Awesome job today. Super insightful. Really appreciate your time. And um, thanks to everybody again who attended live. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and we'll see you again next time. Take care, everybody, and goodbye.